All right. Good morning, uh, members of the East Africa Law Society. You're welcome to the 25th Annual Conference and General Assembly of the East Africa Law Society. We are very honored um, to be able to converge virtually, and it's such an honor and privilege to have everyone log on and uh, get ready to have this experience. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Asmahani Saad. I am the Secretary General of the East Africa Law Society, and I'm here in two capacities this morning. One is to moderate this session, which is our opening session for our annual conference. And also I'm here on behalf of the Governing Council of the East Africa Law Society to officially open and welcome you all to our 25th annual law conference. So this year, our theme is for this conference is remembering our journey. It's been 25 years of the East Africa Law Society, and we are so honored and privileged to have walked a 25 year journey as a society, as professionals, with all our stakeholders, our partners, and everyone who has made this journey possible. So thank you so much. Um, this year, specifically 2020, has been such um, an unprecedented year. We all know what has been going on. Um, but for the East Africa Law Society, we are very honored and privileged to have worked through um, the pandemic and continues to provide um, uh, services and value to our members. And we, and part of that is this virtual conference that we had to ensure that um, despite of the lockdown and everything that is going on through the region, we maintained our culture and ensured that we met virtually for this 25th year round. So thank you for those who have logged in. For those who have not yet, please uh, ask everyone to join in and be part of this unprecedented conference that we are holding virtually. Uh, this year, there are thematic areas that we have chosen specifically to help us walk through our journey uh, for the 25 year journey. And we have themes around the pro bono legal, legal services, which is our opening session this morning. We have um, a theme around access to justice amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. We are going to revisit the East African Community Common Market Protocol and we'll have very interesting and insightful sessions around the East African Community Market Protocol. And then we will look at ELS and at 25, a post-mortem around the 25 years that we have walked this journey. I would like on behalf of the Governing Council to thank our integration and development partners who have continuously worked with us this, uh, in this journey, and we look forward to working yet another 25 year journey. Um, to mention the role Wallenberg Institute, the Open Society Initiative for East Africa, Ford Foundation, SAD, FOID, uh, that is Advocates for International Development, and the African Legal Support facility. We are grateful for all that you have done to support the East Africa Law Society. Would also like to say thank you to the leading law firms that have walked this journey with us. We cannot mention all the firms, but we thank you and we look forward to working yet another 25 years with you. Would also like to thank the institutional members, and that is um, of the guarantors for the East Africa Law Society, the National Bars, to mention the Uganda Law Society, the Law Society of Kenya, Tanganyika Law Society, Zanzibar Law Society, Rwanda Bar Association, and the Burundi um, Bar Association. We are greatly indebted 
for all the support that you have rendered to us. And lastly, last, last but not least, all the members of the East Africa Law Society, thank you for allowing to be part of this society. We have raised a very big um, unprecedented professional body and we have managed to walk a 25 year journey. We have managed to build great networks. We have managed to consistently meet annually and share so much through our profession. And this is just the beginning. So for all our members and our partners and all the support system that we have around East Africa Law Society, we thank you. So without further ado, I'm going to um, officially open the session, this morning session, which is on um, the ELS and it's an it's um, it's ELS and FOID session on promoting culture of pro bono for the legal community in the East Africa region. I would um, like to thank FOID, that is Advocates for International Development, and Roll UK for their continuous partnership that they have rendered to the East Africa Law Society to deliver high level training around business and human rights. We have continuously um, held different workshops, different programs, different trainings around the region. And FOID and Roll UK have played a tremendous role to ensure that businesses or lawyers around the East Africa region are very, very much aware of the human rights practices that, are, that should be rendered as part of the business practice. I um, would also like to thank FOID and Royal UK for the tremendous work they've done in promoting the United Nations uh, principles on business and human rights. They have also rendered such tremendous support in ensuring that the nationals, the countries have um, support in formulating the national plans for their business and human rights practices. Um, so on this specific day, um, FOID is, um, is, is part of this session and we are so happy to have them on board. And our agenda is to clearly discuss and ensure that as we live today, we get back to that place where we remember the importance of the culture of pro bono and also have an opportunity to learn and understand why it is important for us as lawyers around the region to, to um, give back to our communities through pro bono. Um, we also expect to have um, um, shared experiences, success stories, and impact of what pro bono legal services have been to our society and our communities at large. We will also discuss the challenges that have been a limitation to the provision of legal services, especially for commercial law firms. Would also like to identify the attributes of pro bono legal services and best practices for engaging pro bono legal practice. Again, through this session, we would want to set our goal and ensure that we start um, a national and regional conversation on the need to develop guide guidelines towards mobilizing commitment and engagement by lawyers in the East Africa region to incorporate uh, pro bono practice in their legal practices. Would also like to identify areas of law and possible approaches that the legal community in the East Africa region can use pro bono legal assistance to support civil society, development organizations, and social enterprises to address emerging challenges in different areas of law to cope with the adverse impact of the global crisis, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also to open our minds on how else can we prepare for such instances if we are to ever face such challenges in our society. So it is my greatest honor to introduce to you our panelists for this session. Um, we have um, uh, the CEO of FOID, uh, Ms. Yasmin Batiwala, and we have uh, Aisha Abdallah, who is a partner 
of ALN Kenya and Jawala and Kana, Robert Powell, who is the director of Pro Bono, Way Godshall and manages uh, and manages LLP UK, Faith Odiambo, LSK Council member and convener Peel, the Legal Aid and Human Rights Committee. And lastly, we have Luke McMichael, who is the Pro Bono Legal Services Officer for FOID, which is the Advocates for International Development. Um, I would love to now uh, ask um, or introduce to you uh, Ms. Uh, Yasmin Batiwala, who is the CEO of FOID, who will come in and give us our opening remarks and then we will get into our presentations. Thank you so much. And we hope um, you have a very, very fruitful time. In case you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to use the chat box. We have a technical support team that is ready to respond. If you have any questions or would like to have an interactive discussion, uh, once again, please take, uh, make use of the chat box. Yasmin, I'll hand over to you now. You're welcome. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> I'm really delighted to join all of you at this session, <clears throat> which is focused on the culture of pro bono. It is really a pleasure and an honor for me to be asked to make the opening remarks. And um, we have, I think it would be fair to say, a very distinguished um, panel of speakers at this session. So I have no doubt that we are in for a treat. Now, I work in the business of pro bono. Advocates for International Development, or A4ID as we are known, is an international charity that works with pro bono lawyers to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Our mission is the eradication of poverty using the law and lawyers in that fight. But what do we mean when we talk about legal pro bono? I am aware that legal pro bono means different things to different people. To me, it's simple. Legal pro bono is the provision of legal service and expertise without any compensation. It has been my experience that a number of key features that arise from this de definition. First, my definition does not distinguish between the type and quality of legal service provided pro bono against fee paying work. That is, pro bono matters are given the same level of attention as fee paying matters. Sometimes this is not observed in practice and pro bono work can be deprioritized, if not in quality, then in the time it takes to deliver it. This is obviously understandable, but it is improper. At A4ID, we take pro bono matters that we refer seriously. If the work is completed is at a substandard level or is unreasonably delayed, we address this with our law firm partners. Lawyers offering pro bono therefore must uphold the same standard of service as they do towards their fee-paying clients. Second, my definition does not distinguish the client experience between pro bono and fee earning work. Clients must be treated with the same level of professionalism and respect. Pro bono clients must be listened to and feel empowered by the process. Third, my definition does not restrict the type of clients that can be served pro bono. A common theme is that only individuals can be and should be able to receive pro bono help. There is absolutely no logic in this distinction. Charities, for instance, have legal needs that they cannot afford to meet. And if these needs are met and that the charities can be more effective in the work that they do, then the impact of this pro bono support is increased by orders of magnitude. It therefore makes sense to support charities and this type of pro bono is the type of pro bono that A4ID promotes. In short, the only difference between pro bono and fee earning work is remuneration. So this is the definition of legal pro bono which we operate at A4ID. 
simple, clear, and one which works very well. I do, however, believe that pro bono should be in the DNA of every lawyer, part, if you like, of a gut instinct that injustice should be rectified through the instrument of law, and that it should be available to everyone, not just to those who can afford it. And so now that I have provided a definition of pro bono, you may say, but surely pro bono is only a side activity of the legal profession, with lawyers helping out on their pet projects in their spare time. Maybe years ago, that was true, but it is certainly not true today. Pro bono is now a sophisticated sub-industry of the legal profession, with many full-time lawyers devoted solely to pro bono. Lawyers have a responsibility to ensure the widest access to justice available, and that is available to all. One way of doing it is through the legal pro bono. There is so much demand for legal assistance. The challenge really is to know where to start. One solution, of course, is to utilize pro bono and um, a pro bono broker like A4ID. Now, we have over 850 development partners who comprise primarily of NGOs and civil society organizations with unmet legal needs. We ensure pro bono projects come from vetted development organizations, and we ensure that pro bono projects address concrete legal issues. A4ID works with over 50,000 lawyers around the world who donate thousands of hours of their time for free. So pro bono is no longer a side activity, but is core to the business and values of many of the world's largest law firms. Pro bono is a critical part of the business of a law firm and relates profoundly to the rule of law. Ever increasing costs of legal services means that many people without money will not be able to access legal expertise and that means their legal issues will not be addressed. With this gap between legal support and legal demand, and as it widens, it creates a legal system that is not open to all. In fact, it becomes a legal system only available to those who pay for it. Without avenues of legal recourse, individuals may resort to bribery and corruption of uh, public officials. This means that the rule of law is further weakened. By undertaking legal pro bono, lawyers are correcting this wrong. By simply allowing legal needs to be met by legal expertise, regardless of the means to pay. And when this happens, the system of justice is working effectively. This strengthens the rule of law, which improves the broader systems of justice which lawyers operate. If pro bono strengthens the rule of law, then it creates a stronger market for lawyers to do business. So pro bono is not just good for society, it is good for law firms too. And that invariably means it's good for business. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Yasmin, for those uh, for your opening remarks. Um, we'll now continue with our program. I will now hand over to Ms. Aisha Abdallah, partner of ALN. Uh, good afternoon, Kenya Ajwala. Sorry. <laughs> good afternoon, Aisha. I'll just do. Okay, Aisha, apologies, I, um, I'm, I'm trying to find the profiles, but it's okay, you you can start with your pre presentation, then I'll do the profile after. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Asmahani. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about pro bono work. Um, I'm head of, uh, I'm the patron of our pro bono committee at um, Anjarwala and Kana, and I just wanted to explain um, the steps we're taking 
in our firm and in our network to promote pro bono work. Um, so the first thing we did about three years ago was we set up a pro bono committee um, and we, we, we asked for volunteers across um, all the different departments in the firm. And um, these are people who are already personally committed to undertaking pro bono work. And we, we thought about um, what skill set we had in the firm. And we decided having um, undertaken a survey of our staff to, to try and come up with certain things that we would support. So we can't do everything, but we decided if we were strategic, we could make an impact. And we came up with five themes um, that staff in our firm felt very strongly about and wanted to support. And the themes are as follows that we undertake pro bono work that improves governance and promotes democracy. We assist charities. Um, we, we undertake work that we believe enhances the rule of law and it has to have a public interest element. So um, it has to have an element that goes beyond the individual parties uh, involved in the matter. Um, the fourth is that allows us to use our specific unique position as a full service law firm and to access the network of um, 16 member countries that we have. So anything that is cross-border, um, that is a cross-border project that pulls together best practices is something we're very interested in supporting, um, maybe things like legislative reviews. And the final criteria is um, where we believe there's a flagrant injustice that can't be overlooked. So, so these are the themes and what we do is we have a form that people fill out either internally or externally and they can request us to support a particular project and we look at uh, those applications and we, we compare them to our criteria and if they meet the criteria then we ask for volunteers within the firm to undertake the work and to supervise it. And the job of the committee is, is manifold. It's to ensure that we are using our limited resources effectively uh, and we are able to demonstrate a meaningful impact in our society. We also make sure that the people who volunteer to undertake the work are suitably skilled and appropriately supervised so that the quality of the work is as high as all our other work that we do. And we ensure that there's accountability. So what we do is we have quarterly reporting and we follow our people internally and we ask for progress updates. So when they complete a form and we accept it, we ask them to give us a timeline and we do follow up on this. And then the other thing we do is to encourage our lawyers to dedicate time to pro bono is we treat our pro bono work as if it's billable work. So for purposes of our time recording, um, it is treated as billable work and uh, it is one of the aspects that we cover in our appraisal. So if you have done pro bono work, we look at it very favorably because we want our staff to be well-rounded. So that's just um, the approach we've taken in our firm. Um, how has this um, unfolded during uh, 2020? So there are two very large pro bono projects that we've undertaken. The first is um, we've done a COVID legislative review. So we, we looked at hundreds of, of acts of parliament and laws in Kenya, and we basically looked at them to see what impact uh, the COVID pandemic was having on the ability of people to follow those laws. Um, and we look at we, we, we looked at across a number of industries, so from uh, company laws to manufacturing rules, um, to health and safety guidelines, to employment laws. And we basically came up with quite uh, hundreds of pages of a digest, which we submitted to the Attorney General of Kenya, basically highlighting certain laws that we believe should be suspended during the COVID pandemic, uh, because it was almost impossible for um, people in Kenya to meet those obligations because we had a lockdown and we had all these social distances and restrictions. So um, a, an easy example, for example, is that companies are required to have annual general meetings and these are usually physical. And one of the things we requested was that these um, physical meetings should be postponed and um, there should be an ability to hold virtual meetings or simply to postpone the requirement to have the meeting until people were safely able to convene. So we submitted this to the Attorney General and we submitted proposed amendments to the laws. 
The second big thing we did during COVID was we put together COVID Hub. This is a free resource that is on our airline website. It's available to everyone. And it covers a number of our member countries. We're in 16 countries across Africa. And what we did is we have a section which is frequently asked questions. We have videos, we have opinion articles. We have links to reputable websites where you can follow things like um, advice from government agencies on what you should and shouldn't be doing during COVID. Um, and uh, also the, the, the main aim of this hub is to allow people to get advice on certain legal issues that are very common and are coming up across the world during COVID um, and also to mitigate risk. Um, for example, if you're an organization and you have staff, um, you know, one of the frequently asked questions we were getting was, you know, should we be requiring staff to stay at home? What is the impact on their leave? Uh, what if we don't have sufficient work for them? Um, how do we safely bring people back into the office? And, and those, are some, those are some of the types of information you can find on the hub. Um, so you can see that um, pro bono is very dynamic. And I think from our, um, from the requests we get, we get requests um, through our website, we get people just uh, phoning up, uh, and we also get staff who uh, are interested in certain charities and they put forward requests to us. We see that there's an increased need, um, particularly at this time for pro bono work and high quality pro bono work. And in fact, we are overwhelmed with requests. So one of the challenges we face is being selective and making sure that the projects we choose to support are meaningful projects and are going to have a lasting impact. Um, and I hope um, that gives some ideas to other law firms who want to encourage their staff to do more. I think there's a way you can uh, create systems to incentivize staff to participate in these types of projects. And we totally agree that it is in our best interest to enhance the rule of law. And this is one of the ways that we do it. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha, for such um, an insightful session. Um, I think uh, what has come out very clearly is that um, at your farm at Ajawala, you have been very, um, very consistent and you have uh, been very um, instrumental in um, setting pace for what kind of pro bono work yourselves can decide to have and not being, you know, um, ideally taking up everything from the thematic areas to, you know, having creative ways you're handling it through the, the hub, the pro bono hub, and also that you can clearly um, identify that there's an increased need of pro bono, but not just pro bono, but high quality pro bono work. So that is also very interesting to know that even people who need these services don't just need any kind of service, but they need high quality pro bono services. Thank you so much, Aisha, for those insights. Um, again, I, I apologize. I, um, I did not uh, go through Aisha's brief profile, uh, but in brief, I'll just take it on for a minute. Aisha is the head of the dispute resolution department at ALN Kenya, Ajawala and uh, Kana, covering offices in Nairobi and Mombasa. Her practice focuses on commercial litigation with a particular emphasis on fraud, economic crime, and disputes over land, the environment, and natural resources. Aisha is, a dual qualified, is dual qualified as an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and solicitor of England and Wales. Uh, she joined ANK from Source Mills in Kenya, sorry, in United Kingdom in 2012, and has had substantial experience in complex high value cross border litigation. Aisha was appointed to the MAC Court in 2017, the ADR arm of the Mauritius Chamber of Commerce and Industry, alongside some of the world's most eminent arbitration experts. She is the lead author of the Kenya chapter of the 6th, 7th, 8th, and 10th edition of the International Arbitration Review. She's also a member of the Africa Users Group for Singapore International Arbitration Center. Aisha is part of an expert team that has drafted anti-money laundering, uh, remittances, and mobile money bills for Somaliland, and is the lead author for the Kenya chapter of the 2018 Chambers 
um, Anti-Corruption Global Practice Guide. She is also the lead author of the ALN Anti-Corruption Guide 2019. Aisha provides training and writes and speaks on wide range of contentious issues, including international arbitration, corruption, economic crime, and pro bono work. Aisha is rated and recognized by Chamber, Chambers Global and Legal 500 for her work. Thank you so much, Aisha, for your time. Um, so next, uh, I will move to our next uh, panelist to take us through his discussion before we break into our panel discussion. I would also like to remind um, our members, if you have any questions or comments, kindly note them. We are going to get into a panel discussion after the next panelist and would love for it to be as interactive as possible so that the objectives of this session are met. So our next panelist is Robert Powell, who is the direct, director of Pro Bono, Well Gottschall and Managers LLP UK. Uh, so briefly, Mr. Powell is the art architect of the London Office's award-winning corporate responsibility and inclusion CR and I program, primarily responsible for running the London pro bono practice and designing community initiatives such as well, widening entry into law and improving lives and raises aspirations 2013. He also works with colleagues on inclusion, well-being and sustainability initiatives. He is a frequent speaker on the social responsibility circuit and regularly contributes to industry reports and thought leadership articles. He is also on the board of Special Olympic GB and Heart of the City and on the advisory board of several UK charities. Uh, Robert, we are very, very honored to have you for this session and I'll hand over to you now for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and it, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. It, it's morning time in the UK, um, where I currently am, just outside of London. Um, but it's a real pleasure to speak to so many of you and, and great to see such a great attendance. Um, and, you know, I'd, I, it was fantastic listening to Aisha um, talking about um, their pro bono practice and what they've done to develop that, because there was a number of um, points and steps which they have taken, which are the things that you know Weil did um, a number of years ago, and, and they're a great starting point to developing a, a pro bono practice and a pro bono culture. So let me just start with a little bit of information about Weil. Um, we are a law firm. We're headquartered in New York. Um, we employ around 2,000 um, people across the world. I'm based in the London office uh, where we have about 400 people almost. Um, and we call pro bono our finest hours. Um, that's, that's the phrase that we use. And when I joined Weil, um, about six years ago. I love that phrase because pro bono, you know, we take great pride in the pro bono work that we do. And it really is our finest hours. Um, and, and just listening to Aisha um, talking about some of the practical steps they took, um, you know, it all makes perfect sense because, you know, first of all, we need to develop some structure to pro bono so we need to have things like a committee you know a small group of people within the law firm who are passionate about pro bono who want to drive pro bono forwards um, on behalf of the law firm also things like having a pro bono policy which sets out um you know what um you know pro bono is so yasmin spoke at the beginning about the definition of pro bono and i appreciate there are many different definitions um but you know for us at while very similar to um a4id you know pro bono is the provision of free legal advice to individuals or organizations that are unable to afford or access legal representation and as lawyers, as members of the legal profession, 
you are in a position where you have um, a magical power. You know, you have skills and resources and expertise and talent that you can use for the public good. Um, and so at while, you know, we have a pretty far reaching pro bono practice um, and we um, advise NGOs, charities, social enterprises and individuals um, in all manner of social issues. So it could be homelessness, it could be human rights, it could be environmental justice, it could be poverty, social mobility, um, food, what access to food, um, you know, whatever it is, what we try to apply is um, a number of things. One is, do we have the expertise to do the pro bono work? And I think that's something which Aisha talked about, about being selective. You know, we can't take on every single request we receive. Um, so, you know, we um, work with clients, pro bono clients, who, again, very similar to what Yasmin and both Aisha said, you know, our pro bono clients um, are treated in exactly the same way as our fee paying clients, both in terms of the due diligence we carry out, the engagement terms and the service delivery. And one of the best parts of my job is when I receive feedback uh, from pro bono clients to say that they felt um, amazing. They felt like we um, treated them just like a fee paying client and that we were always on the end of the phone. We were really responsive um, and we really listened and got to understand the challenges the organization um, was facing. So it, it's, it's, it's good to, you know, if, if I was starting completely from scratch, I would say start small and think big. So, you know, first of all, think about, you know, your core areas of practice as a law firm. What areas of law do you practice on behalf of your fee paying clients? And then think about how those areas could align with advising a charity, for example. Um, so it could be on strengthening governance within charitable organizations or civil society organizations. Um, it could be helping social enterprises to raise finance. Um, so your finance practice could, could help. It could be employment law or intellectual property. Um, so I think the important thing is to start small, think big and be selective and do take on pro bono work that you have the capability and expertise and of course the capacity to help. Um, you know, with um, setting up a, a pro bono committee, I mean, I guess, given the number of people who are attending this event today, there are a huge number of people in the region who are passionate about pro bono. Um, so within your law firm, a good starting point when you finish um, this event today is to go back to your colleagues um, and speak to colleagues who you know um, feel strongly about pro bono with the view to setting up um, a committee. And, and I think Aisha mentioned a survey. So I love surveys. I'm a massive fan of going out to my colleagues to um, obtain information about pro bono. What types of pro bono work do they want to do? Um, what social issues? Do they feel passionate about? Do they like big pro bono cases or kind of discrete pro bono matters? And we do this every two years. So we survey all of our partners and lawyers um, and we ask those three questions. What social issues do you care about? What types of pro bono work do you want to do? And do you like kind of long term big pro bono projects or kind of small discrete requests. And that then helps us to bring in pro bono work that we know people um, in the office are passionate about. And it also helps to then farm the pro bono work out. So we encourage 
all of our lawyers across the world to do 50 hours of pro bono a year. Um, and similar to Aisha, which I was really impressed by as well, we um, don't distinguish between pro bono work and billable work. Um, pro bono is counted as billable hours. Um, and this sends a very important message to um, our lawyers on the importance of pro bono and how seriously um, the firm takes it. So it's statements like that um, and having a committee and a policy and some structure um, that can really help you um, get your pro bono practice off the ground. In terms of bringing in pro bono work, um, you know, there, there are, unfortunately, we live in a world where there are so many vulnerable people, um, so many social issues to tackle. Um, but fortunately, so many incredible organizations that are working so hard to support those vulnerable people and tackle those social issues. So there is no limit to um, a pipeline of pro bono work. You just need to kind of be selective. And so we, you know, in London, in the London office alone, we have about 70 pro bono clients and they range from large charities and NGOs down to grassroots community organizations and social enterprises and everything in between. Um, and so we do a lot of work with A4ID. Um, we are one of the founding law firms um, of A4ID. Um, and we're a proud long-term um, supporter. So we're one of their legal partners. And what that means is that we receive a weekly email from FYD, which sets out a, a range of different pro bono opportunities. Um, and so we've done a lot of work um, over the years on pro bono matters, which work to um, try and achieve the sustainable development goals. So a couple of examples, um, we um, advised e East um, Apparel Africa, which is a great organization that supports African owned apparel manufacturers to access and compete in global markets. So we help them to raise um, a couple of million pounds of investment. So our banking and finance team, our private equity team had the skills, the capability and the capacity to advise on that. We also helped Cafe um, Direct Producers Foundation. Again, um, a great organization that supports smallholder farmers in Africa and Latin America. Um, and they developed something called WeFarm, which is a digital platform which shares information um, to improve livelihoods of smallholder farmers without access to the internet. Um, and they'd already achieved at this point, you know, 30,000 followers in Kenya, Uganda, and Peru, but they wanted to reach 1 million users. Um, so this is, this, is, this is a great example of the impact of Pro Bono. So we helped them to raise um, again, $2 million of Series A funding um, so they could invest in the technology and the platform to um, scale up. So, you know, it's a real pleasure for us to work with these organizations because they're, they're working hard and they have a clear mission and, and a clear strategy um, to provide social impact. And our role as lawyers is to help them do that. Um, and so I, just to kind of summarize, um, if I was to kind of leave you with um, five kind of takeaway messages, um, one would be to find some colleagues in your law firm who are equally as passionate about pro bono as you are um, and start a committee. Go out, number two would be to um, survey your colleagues to find out what social issues what types of pro bono work they are interested in. And then number three would be to, from that information, develop some broad umbrella thematic areas that you can kind of align different pro bono matters within. So something which Aisha mentioned. Um, number four is then to, you know, bring in work 
pro bono work, but be selective, again, which Aisha mentioned. And then number five is to actually do the pro bono work and celebrate that pro bono work. Tell people, tell your colleagues that, you know, this team or that team have just advised this client because the more we talk about pro bono, the more we celebrate pro bono internally, the more it encourages others to, to get involved. And that's the first steps towards building a pro bono culture. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we'll have time um, for questions at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert, for such an insightful um, uh, presentation. Um, I think uh, just to remind us, um, the Uganda Law Society um, is running its pro bono week uh, starting on the 30th of November to the 4th of December this year. So I think uh, this topic would not have come at a better time. So like just part of the, the pointers you've left us with is to rally ourselves, our colleagues, and start talking pro bono. And not just talking pro bono, but um, areas that we are very good at, areas we're passionate about. And then start, start small. Like you said, we start small and scale it up. I also love the fact that you say that, you know, we should be able to celebrate our pro bono work internally and then be able to share it with other people so that we can encourage more and more people to be versatile in their practice, to be open to, you know, sharing what they know with uh, the less privileged and in a way also um, provide the same quality as the billable work. I think that is also very, very important um, for us uh, lawyers in our mindset, knowing that your work is, your time is worth the money, we sell time. So thank you so much, Robert. Um, uh, we now come to the end of our presentations and uh, we are going to open up our panel discussions. Uh, so for all the members who are here, I've, uh, I've seen a couple of questions uh, come through during uh, Robert's uh, uh, presentation. Um, if you have, uh, to our members, if you have any um, panelists that you'd want to answer your questions specifically, you can indicate that. Um, if not, then uh, our back room, our back end will be picking up the questions and uh, we will random, randomly share them with our panelists and hope that for the next 30 minutes, we will be able to have a very interactive and fruitful discussion leading us into better legal practitioners. So I will introduce our panelists, uh, the rest of our panelists. Um, our third panelist is Faith Odiambo from the Law Society of Kenya, uh, Law Society of Kenya, PIL, PIL, the Legal Aid and Human Rights Committee. Faith is a member of the Council of the Law Society of Kenya and the convener of the, of the LSK Public Interest Litigation, Legal Aid and Human Rights Committee. She is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a partner at MMA Advocates LLP, where she heads the corporate and uh, commercial department. Faith has also been a lecturer at the University of Nairobi and the Catholic University of East Africa, where she taught commercial law, insurance law, labor law, securities regulation, bankruptcy, criminology, among others. She has a bachelor's of law degree from Catholic University of East Africa and a master's of law in competition law, international financial services and foreign investment law from Kent University. Faith Karibu, we're so happy to have you on our panel. You. Um, lastly is uh, Luke McMichael, who is a representative from the Advocates for International Development, that is A4ID. Luke is the pro bono legal services officer at A4ID. In the role, in his role, he facilitates the provision of pro bono legal services from FOID's legal partners, consisting of some of the world's leading law firms, barristers, in-house lawyers, and legal academics, to FOID development partners, consisting of NGOs, nonprofit organizations, some social enterprises, and developing country law societies, bar associations, 
and governments who are working to advance the U UN Sustainable Development Goals. A look is South African, is a South African qualified attorney and has over eight years of experience in the legal profession as a lawyer and a legal advisor. Before he joined A4ID, Luke worked in the private practice as an environmental and planning lawyer with Norton Ross, um, Fulbright South Africa in Johannesburg, where he worked primarily on large scale infrastructure projects in the renewable energy and mining industries in the southern part of Africa. As a lawyer, he has experience in corporate and commercial law. Luke also volunteers as a senior researcher at the Blockchain and Climate Institute. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Honours degree in Environmental Science and Law from Rhodes University, a Bachelor of Laws and Masters of Laws specialising in Environmental Law, both from the University of Cape Town. What an honour to have you look on this panel. So I would um, I would ask our panelists uh, to um, unmute themselves, and um, we will start our panel discussion. Um, I will ask uh, 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 Faith and Luke uh, to just briefly have their opening remarks for the panel session. Uh, within two minutes, then we can open it up uh, to the members. Thank you. Faith, you can go first. Okay, um, thank you. And thank the East African Law Society for this opportunity to discuss um, the importance of pro bono work. So for us as the Law Society of Kenya, we recognize the importance of pro bono work and we have set up a committee, which I chair as part of the council that ensures that we offer um, pro bono work to the um, pro bono services to the members of the public um, stemming from the fact that we have over 17,000 lawyers, um, it's only imperative that we also give back to the society. Um, we have recently, um, due to some of the challenges that even um, the panelists mentioned um, as they were speaking, um, us as the Law Society of Kenya, we've always had challenges in terms of bureaucracy, in terms of how the council appoints, PI lawyers, identifying cases timely to be able to intervene. Um, it's a bit time consuming, the limited resources, and also trying to regulate um, since there's no actual law that strictly regulates um, pro bono work. And also the, the apathy, there's no um, pro bono culture that has since been developed um, that has picked up, though I'm encouraged by what firms like Ellen are doing. Um, so for us, what we have tried to do is encourage as much as possible for advocates to volunteer their time to sit in that committee so that we have set various subcommittees that we're able to manage and also ensure that we sort of um, ensure proper service delivery to be able to make follow-ups that not only is LSK allocating pro bono advocates to handle different matters, but also those matters are handled professionally and we're able to get feedback from our clients. Um, we set up the toll free line once COVID-19 um, COVID hit. And so we, 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 are, we are able also to share to members of the public when we launched it, that members of the public are able to call in, um, especially due to the various violations that were being done by the police, trying to enforce the curfew. Um, we have, been able to stabilize the scene and have a lot of members of the public calling in. And because we had developed a, a robust pro bono list, also indicating the various sections of the country where each lawyer is found, we're able to send out our pro bono lawyers to timely act and intervene in various uh, matters. So as we go on in the discussion, I'll be able to share also some of the things that um, the Law Society has been able to develop and also implement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faith. I'll hand over to Luke, uh, two minutes, and then we can start the quick Q&A. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And it's, it's really, it's a pleasure to, to be here um, and to talk with everyone. Um, so in my role at A5D, I, I act as a, 
intermediary between organizations working in international development and we work with over 850 organizations and we will partner them, um, we will work closely with them to scope their, their legal requests and circulate those to our network of legal partners. And we have over 50 formal legal partners. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's been mentioned, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of need out there. So at A5D, what we try to do is work really closely with our development partners and understand and what the most impact, impactful and interesting projects we can scope um, for our legal partners and ensure that those projects are scoped and brokered to our legal partners. Um, I just wanted to mention, um, as, as we work with a lot of development partners, we kind of have a, 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 a bird's eye view of, of the impact of COVID on, on the, the charity sector. And it's, it's obviously been significant. And this year, well, since the pandemic, there's really been a huge increase in demand um, for, for requests from our development partners. Um, and a lot of them are operating in, in East Africa. Um, so we're getting a lot of very interesting, high impact requests in, in the region. Um, and we, we have a very strong network of lawyers that we work with um, being based in the UK. Um, we, we also have uh, Patrick, uh, my colleague based in, in Kenya. Um, we, we always find that we have very strong support um, in, in the UK, um, but um, we often need in-country support in, in various East African countries, um, which is, it can be slightly more challenging. So it's really great to be here with everyone. Um, and we, from this, I'd really be keen to, to kind of hopefully get some people more involved um, with the pro bono matters we, we're working on in the region. And, and a lot of these requests are, are that they entail very high impact projects that I can go through later. Um, and a, a lot of the skills that you have, you know, whether it's commercial law, corporate law, um, even legal research skills um, is, is what's really needed by our network. All right, thank you, Luke. Um, I also want to welcome um, uh, Ms. Um, Mary Mutoni, if you can hear me, are you available now? Uh, Mary Mutoni is an advocate from the Rwanda Legal Aid Forum, and she will also be here to share some perspectives on, on pro bono from Rwanda. Mary, are you on? Okay, so as uh, we wait for Mary to join, I will um, take on some questions from the chat box and um, I will just uh, randomly ask the panelists to answer them. I think I'll take four questions per session so we can be able to pick as many questions as possible and also have, have this session as interactive as possible. So the first question is from Advocate Munabi Phillips, who is a member of the Uganda Law Society. Um, his question is, he wants to know the difference. He, he, he says that there is a need to make a clear difference between provision of pro bono and legal aid services. And uh, this is more specific. He says more so here in Uganda, but I think it also cuts across the region. Um, so I will, I will channel this question to Aisha. Um, the second question is, how is it practically possible for Rwandan advocates to offer um, to offer pro bono services in Kenya, considering the fact that Kenyan courts have declared inclusion of Rwanda and Burundi in the Advocates Act and Constitutional? Um, this is uh, Advocate Yegon Kipkori. I hope I I called I um, got that name correctly. And I will channel this question to Faith from uh, LSK. Um, the next question is from um, Advocate Agnes Ndaba. And she asks, how do we ensure value for pro bono services? And by this, I mean offering the service to the people that actually need it. The people that need the service but are actually not aware that um, the service exists. So I will channel this to Robert Powell. 
Um, and then uh, the last question we'll take um, is, um, what is the relationship or cross-cut between the pro bono offered by advocates as private practitioners and that offered by governments, state attorneys, especially in criminal matters? And this is from advocate uh, Lucius Bati GT. I didn't get the country she's from. Um, but I'll channel this to look. Um, thank you so much. So I'll open up uh, the panel uh, discussions. Aisha, you can go first. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so I think the the question was what is the distinction between pro bono work and um, and work provided by governments uh, in the form of maybe legal aid or free representation for um, criminal uh, suspects and defendants. So the distinction is really not the type of work, but it's more who is doing it. So if, if the person who is undertaking the work is being paid for it by the employer, so you're a government lawyer, you're being paid a salary, and a part of your uh, duty is to defend suspects in court or to provide a certain service for free to the recipient, then that will be government uh, related or it might be a form of legal aid. If you are not being paid for that work, so I at Anjawala and Kana, I'm a partner. Um, I'm not paid any extra for the pro bono work I do it. I do it uh, because I believe strongly that it's important, but I'm not being paid for it. There's no um, client that is paying me to do the work, then that is pro bono. And I think um, really it's complementary because we want people, we want the government to fulfill its duty, which is to provide more free legal services to people. In a country like Kenya, we don't have enough lawyers available for people. And uh, most of us are out of reach of normal uh, Wanainchi. And we also want private practice lawyers to do more pro bono work and they are complementary things. They don't, one doesn't replace the other and we need both of them. We need the government to do more, but we also call upon our each other as private practice people to also do more pro bono. So I hope um, that gives you uh, some answer to your question. Thank you, Aisha. I'll next hand over to Faith. Um, thank you um, for for that. Um, I always say there's always the politics behind it with regards to the question of reciprocity in practice. And our representative from Kenya, Barbara Malawa, will tell you that it's always been a struggle um, to ensure also Kenya is able to practice in Uganda and Tanzania, yet they're able to practice in Kenya. However, what the Law Society of Kenya is currently working on is there's a bill that has been proposed by a member of Senate um, to be placed before Parliament to deliberate on the issue of Rwanda and Burundian lawyers being able to practice in Kenya. And as the Law Society will do our part to try and support the bill to go through. Um, so that's how far we are with the same because the challenge of the courts was that it's in the law. So unless the law is changed to facilitate the same, then unfortunately for now, you're not able to offer services. But as the Law Society of Kenya, we'll be working with Parliament to ensure that the bill goes through, at least from our part. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. I'll hand over to Robert. Thank you. Um, and just the, the question from, from Agnes, it's a great question around how do we direct pro bono to um, the people that really need the service, um, who perhaps are not aware that this service exists. And it's a great question. And obviously, it, it will take time to, to, to reach the hardest to reach. Um, because, you know, often, you know, a vulnerable individual or a very small charity may not be aware that law firms are offering pro bono services. And that's why it's a good idea to collaborate with, you know, law societies, with FYD, for example. FYD can, you know, do a lot of that work for you by, um, you know, they work with, as Luke mentioned, they work with so many different 
um, charities and, and organizations, which they call development partners, um, to scope out their legal needs. Um, and so a good starting point is to, to kind of collaborate and work with other organizations like FOID or, or law societies or other law firms. You know, we find in the UK that um, although the, the, the big law firms um, you know, we're all competitors when it comes to fee paying clients. Um, but when it comes to, to pro bono, we're very collaborative. Um, and we, in fact, a number of years ago, set up something called the UK Collaborative Plan for Pro Bono, which is about um, 55 law firms now. Um, and we meet every two months. Um, and together, we have set up a number of legal clinics in specific areas of law that target um areas which were have been cut from legal aid um so to just to answer the question to summarize my answer um as a starting point you know partner with other organizations speak to fyd speak to other law firms who are who are active in pro bono um the law society um and as i said at the beginning start small and think big and as more law firms in East Africa start to do pro bono work, that's when, you know, the really small charities or organizations or vulnerable individuals will become aware that pro bono is a service they can potentially access. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. I'll now hand over to Luke to answer the last question. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the question. And, and I think it's, um, you know, what is the relationship between pro bono and, and private practice and, and criminal matters? I, I think generally with criminal matters, um, there is state um, representation um, of, of defendants. So this kind of really goes to the, the legal aid versus pro bono argument. Um, what AFID does is we we work with charities, and it's just important to note there is there's generally no legal aid for charities, um, you know. Whereas for 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 criminal defendants, there is legal aid. Um, it, it may be debatable on kind of the the quality of rep representation, but where AFID is, is coming from um, is is ready to fill that gap where there is actual no legal aid and support or state support for the legal uh, needs of of charities. Um, and, and we also, we focus on this because most of our legal partners are commercial lawyers or, or they're corporate law firms. They don't, outside of white collar crime, they don't, um, they don't practice criminal law. So we're trying to get commercial lawyers to use their day-to-day -day skills um, to, do, to do pro bono. And that's, that's the, the type of pro bono we, we really are encouraging. Um, and it's just, yeah, I just also wanted to, to note, um, especially since um, the COVID outbreak, there have been... I think globally, um, quite severe cuts to a lot of charities, uh, both from public sector funding and also from private sector funding. So I think kind of now more than ever, there really is a, a need for pro bono support for, for, um, for charities because they, they can't rely on, on state aid. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Luke. Um, thank you to all our um, panelists for uh, those great insights and to all our members. Um, there's one more question from, um, from one of our members. He didn't indicate his name. I just have Galaxy J8. And his question is, basing on your experiences, for how long does a law firm take before initiating a pro bono committee? Um, Yes, and I'll just briefly go through some of the comments that are coming through uh, before we can answer that. Uh, there's a comment here that says uh, from Loy. Uh, Loy says that, Advocate Loy says that I agree with that as the saying goes, sticks and carrots. If there are no incentives, then recognition, appreciation and celebration of pro bono work is valuable than money. So thank you for that comment. Um, also, we, we have a few minutes left uh, before our panelists answer that question. If um, there is any of our members who would like to ask our questions uh, live, you can please raise your hand. 
and uh, the back end will unmute your mic and you can be able to directly um, channel your question to any member of the panel um, before we close our session. So I'll just hand over to Aisha or any other panelist who would like to answer the question on how long it would take uh, for a law firm to set up a committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, a committee can be a committee of one. Uh, you don't need a lot of people. Um, when, when we started, it was because we had a head of knowledge and uh, we were just chatting about previous pro bono work he had done in Australia and I'd done in the UK. And we said, you know what, let's just set up a committee and we'll be the founders and we'll just see who's interested. And we just sent an email round to the um, lawyers. And then we started thinking a bit more clearly and thinking, well, we don't want to you know, we want volunteers to cover all the departments because when we get requests in, those are the, the people we'll use to try and get volunteers within their departments. And, um, but what I'm saying is initially it started as just two people and then it sort of, it, it grew over time. Um, and we didn't have a budget. We actually don't have a pro bono budget at the moment. What we do is we lean on people for favors. So we usually lean on our business development team when we're doing an event or we're doing some sort of newsletter. And we, we, you know, we tell them you should help us because it's part of our policy. Um, but we actually don't have a budget. And, and um, my co-founder used to get his cook to bake cakes to try and incentivize lawyers to attend our meetings. So it was very, very, you know, it started very small, what we call Juakali. And, you know, there's nothing fancy about it. Um, and we said, you know, we don't want to spend money on our committee because if we're spending money on our committee, we're actually not spending it on our recipients. So we'd rather just, you know, we'd rather be lean and, and extremely poor <laughs> in the way we run our committee. So it's, it's really just based on volunteers. There's not a lot of money, but there's a lot of careful thought that goes behind uh, what we do. So I, I wouldn't worry about, you know, you have to be a certain size or you have to have, you could just start with yourself. You can give yourself a nice title, pro bono, you know, patron of pro bono, and no one has to know it's only you initially. Um, and then you can just talk to people. But but I think, I think it's more important to start somewhere than to worry about uh, support. I think the support comes uh, as you show that you're, you know, having an impact. And sometimes people wait and see what you can do before they join you. But I don't think that should stop you from, from starting, even if it's just you. Um, so maybe I could also chip in. Um, I would quote what my mentor says, Professor Patricia Kameri Mbote, that there's no good idea that ever goes unfunded. Um, our LSK looks like a very huge body, but I could say without a doubt that the Law Society of Kenya doesn't have a PIL fund, though we want to set up one. So we even ran the, um, law, uh, the Legal Awareness Week from a zero budget and through various partners and various law firms, we were able to raise more than $20,000 to support the various events that we were doing. So I don't think it really takes that you have to be more than one. Um, and also if you're a small firm, Maybe ideas for you is to work with different organizations that are offering pro bono services. There's the Federation of Women Lawyers, there's FIDA Kenya, you can partner also as different law firms and come together and offer pro bono services. So for me, I agree with Aisha and Terry that um, set what you want to do. And for me, even there are more areas of practice that probably we need to expand pro bono services. Everyone believes pro bono services is limit, limited to litigation. And I don't think so. There is ADR in a vast um, other areas and even specializations that you need to offer pro bono services to. And even something that many people don't think about is that pro bono services also offers opportunities. There are various clients who will come to you and you will offer them pro bono services, but the next time they will look for you to offer you paid services because of the quality of work that you gave them and your professionalism, irrespective of the fact that it was pro bono. So I don't think you should wait and worry about um, how much money you need or how many people you need to set up. If you have the passion and the drive, just set it up and start and you'll see what um, wonders you'll be able to do. 
Thanks. Thank you, Faith. Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Advocate Mary Mutoni, if you're on now. Mary Mutoni from uh, Randa Bar Association. Um, the back end team, can you kindly unmute her mic? She had issues with uh, unmuting her mic. So we just wanted to hear you, uh, the random perspective. And there is a specific question here, which is in French. Unfortunately, I'm unable to read it. So Mary can take that question as well. Mary Musoni. You're welcome, Mary. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me on this uh, webinar. I've been invited to talk about pro bono and legal aid in Rwanda. Um, so pro bono, uh, if you look at the internal rules and can see me now. So pro bono is uh, in Rwanda, it's really championed by the Rwanda Bar Association. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the, <clears throat> it champions the provision of pro bono work in Rwanda. For example, if you look at the internal rules and regulations of the Rwanda Bar Association, it's Article 130. Uh, for an advocate, achieving pro bono shall consist in handling a case of needy person free or at a much reduced rate. Any advocate registered on the role of advocates has therefore the obligation to assist uh, an indigent person on their own initiative or to be assisted or to be assigned by the authorities of the Rwanda Bar Association. So quite different from the organization that I'm working for and that is the Legal Aid Forum. Uh, we do give the same services, but just going back to what my colleague Aisha said, uh, we hire lawyers to give legal aid to indigents and we have them with a, with, with a remuneration at the end of the day. So it's quite different from what uh, the Rwanda Bar Association does because for it, it facilitates, there's a sort of facilitation to lawyers that do take on these pro bono cases, whereas with us, we have, retain, we have lawyers that are on retainer that we pay to make sure that there's this service delivery. So, Whereas it's the overall coordinator at the national level of pro bono, uh, it would be good to decentralize pro bono services because lawyers are part of the community that we live in. Uh, so instead of waiting for maybe a case at the end of the year or to do one of cases, it would be good uh, to do cases that have not been assigned by the Rwanda Bar Association because how it's done in Rwanda, it is the bar that calls you and then assigns you a pro bono case. But we also have people in our societies that we do assist without, uh, and these cases maybe will never go to the bar association and maybe that is where the challenge is. So if there's a framework to also recognize that this, this work that is being done in the background, uh, it would be able maybe to reach quite uh, a few people. So uh, increasing pro bono work or increasing commitment to ensure that there's effective delivery pro bono work Maybe one way to be to encourage more, aware, more awareness through the use of such platforms like what DLC has organized. Uh, educate society because most of our community or most of our citizens are not aware of such organizations such as the Rwanda Bar Association and the services that they offer. Also encourage young lawyers uh, like myself uh, to really engage in pro bono work because most of us, maybe also look at the context in which we find ourselves if when, like most of us it's quite hard to do pro bono work because at the end of the day, you get to foot your own bill. So that maybe can also be challenging. Uh, so, but if there's a way of incentives, which my organization has come in to establish, if there's all of uh, providing incentives to, to these lawyers to encourage pro bono work, maybe that would go a long way. Also provide trainings for young lawyers and lawyers with unrelated expertise to develop their skills necessary to meet the needs of their clients. Also, there's a need to match cases with people's areas of expertise because you'd find that you are called to take on a case that you're not well conversant with. So maybe, and that would also discourage some people from going for Pobono because sometimes you tend to do cases that not, you're not well aware of or you're not, you do not have enough expertise in. So uh, you find that most people do not go uh, for it 
because of those uh, because of those challenges. So, uh, with that, I've come to the end of my presentation because I was called on short notice to talk about pro bono and legal aid services. I hope that has been meaningful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, glad to have those uh, insights on Rwanda. Um, our time is fast spent, but um, I would like to ask our team at the back end if there are any people who would like to ask their questions live, and we can just take them on for another 10 minutes and then we close. Uh, we apologize for uh, overshooting the time. Do we have any um, any members who uh, would like to ask their questions live? If not, then I'll just uh, read the questions that, um, there are a few questions here, then we can quickly have a panel respond and close. Um, there's a question from Mary, in Advocate Mary in Tunjire. And her question is, how do we provide pro bono to indigent persons who are in designated fields? And um, Mary is from the Ministry of Defense in Uganda. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask any member of the panel who is able to answer this to do that quickly. And then the next question is, is it possible to have, uh, to have um, sorry, I'll say that again. Is it possible to have specialization on pro bono cases? Um, and then Mary also added uh, to her question. So the person answering this uh, allowed me to complete her question. She says, it would be good to be all inclusive uh, since soldiers and veterans are all over the country. And then um, the, the, question, the next question is from Sophia AB, Advocate Sophia AB. Uh, she didn't indicate uh, from which uh, national bar she's from, but her question is, I think it's important to address the issues of free movement of services within the East African region and how the restrictions in certain member countries affect pro bono services. These challenges of free movement of services and even more important now that the continental free trade area has taken off and member countries are still on negotiations of trade in services with the CFTA, that is the continental free trade area. Um, and then the last question would ask is, um, um, this is from our advocate ja Jackie, the name is not very clear. I kindly request the panelists to share their views on ADR, that is alternative dispute resolution, and the possible role of pro bono lawyers. So I'll hand over to you panelists. Should I, should I call you in any specific order? Okay. Um, okay, look, you can go first. Whichever question you want to um, end up. Okay, great, thanks. And just, yeah, just to respond to the question, is it possible to have spe specialization on pro bono? I um, mean, uh, yeah, de definitely. I, I think in terms of the, the projects that we circulate, so we, we would circulate every week. Um, we circulate a list of scope projects and it's usually about 10 and it can, it, it often consists of a variety of different legal specializations. So for example, we would get kind of commercial contracts matters. Um, we would also get kind of specializations like, like tax, um, finance advice is, is needed by charities, um, bribery and corruption advice, um, intellectual property is, is actually quite a strong demand for charities to protect the intellectual property. Um, so yes, the, I mean, there's definitely a strong need for specialist um, skills and pro bono. And I, I think there was a, 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 a kind of a comment earlier that, you know, is, is, is pro bono just litigation? No, it's, it's definitely not. Um, the, 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 we actually, uh, only a minority of the requests we get off for litigation support, the bulk of them are actually basically the, the kinds of projects that um, commercial lawyers deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, including all their specializations. So, so thanks. Uh, 
Um, Aisha, any specific question you would want to answer? Uh, maybe, maybe I think one of the one of the challenges that was mentioned was how do you make sure you're reaching indigent people and uh, making sure you're reaching outside of uh, maybe the capital cities. So I think that's a challenge because a lot of us are concentrated in maybe Kampala, Robi, um, and and there's obviously unmet needs outside. But I think this would require a partnership. Uh, between people um, who are on the ground in rural communities and um, you know other organizations who are on the ground who have some somehow have a link back to maybe uh, lawyers through people like Faith of Yangwa at the Law Society. Um, I was really pleased to hear that you guys have a toll-free line, so I think we're going to try and publicize that on our website actually. Um, but I think there's a lot of linkage that would need to take place to match the need outside of in these areas where people maybe can't access the services as well back to people who can provide the service and i think that's a challenge and there's obviously a role not just for civil society but i would think that there's a role there for the government because i would think it's a government responsibility uh, certainly under our constitution, it's a duty upon the government to make sure fundamental rights and freedoms are enjoyed throughout Kenya and not just for the privileged people in the urban areas. So there's a role for government, there's a role for law society, there's a role for people like me, but we need people on the ground to bring forward such cases. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Um, Robert? Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, just, just to add to, to Luke's um, response to the question around um, specialization. So, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the really important parts of, of pro bono, just in, in, this, in very much the same way as when we advise clients in a fee paying commercial capacity, is that the work involved is clearly defined and scoped out from the outset. So when we enter into um, a relationship with a pro bono client, we know what their legal needs are and where we communicate with them what we can do and what we can't do. Um, and that could be IP, it could be employment, it could be corporate law, it could be finance, it could be all manner of diff different things. So there is definitely um, a need for specialist um, pro bono and yeah, to, to further Luke's uh, point earlier as well pro bono is much more than litigation um, and we, through the areas I, I, I've just mentioned so pro bono is very broad um, and it can touch upon many areas all right thank you a faith any comment maybe I'll add also to what Aisha was talking about in terms of offering pro bono services um, to indigent areas. As the Law Society of Kenya, what we do is that we have tried to um, devolve uh, PRL to the branches. So we are trying to work on a living document on how the dev devolution of PRL to branches will work. But what we currently do in terms of matters practice and welfare, we delegate to the branches because the branches have also centers and they are able to reach the members directly and members of the public and also the cost of traveling is not there because if you are at Malindi or you're at Kitui, um, that's your base of practice. And so if there's an issue, we don't have to send a lawyer from Nairobi to handle the matter, that the branches can take it up and they're able to offer pro bono services to the various members in the various parts of the country. Um, what also I wanted to comment on was in terms of ADR and pro bono services, um, I think that question came from Judith. Um, what, as I said earlier, a lot of us think that pro bono services is limited to litigation and it's not. Um, I have offered a lot of pro bono hours to Federation Women Lawyers through mediation and what the Law Society of Kenya is trying to do is to partner with the ADR committee to be able to set up um, pro bono in terms of mediation, negotiation, and the likes 
to offer to members of the public because um, we realize that you also shorten cases by handling them through alternative dispute resolution. And so you, you can have pro bono um, using ADR. It's just that a lot of the specialized lawyers who have taken up that area of practice have not really moved to that area. But now that mediation um, has really taken root, particularly in the Kenyan courts, um, and the Kenyan courts use a lot of pro bono lawyers to offer um, services in terms of mediation before you file cases in court and it's become mandatory. So a lot of lawyers are taking up mediation, but we want to expand it um, beyond mediation to other alternative dispute resolution um, services that can be offered and also train our lawyers to be able to offer such services so, um, as the Law Society of Kenya, because as much as we can give you a small stipend, it's also limited because of the number, the volume of pro bono cases that is needed and the demand. So what we do is we try to offer trainings to support lawyers in how they deliver their practice to ensure they deliver um, also quality services. So in that process, we are helping you build your legal skills, but at the same time offering you those skills to be able to offer them pro bono if you're part of a pro bono list of lawyers and you, you have been offering services. So for me, pro bono is an untapped, um, ADR is an untapped area in pro bono uh, matters that we are seeking to expand on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Faith. Um, unfortunately, our time is very, very fast spent. I'll just allow for the one, I think there was one person who had raised his hand. I was informed by a back end team. Are they still on? So we can take their question live. Uh, David Singano, do we have, do we still have the quest, the people, the members would love to ask their questions live? Okay, they lowered their hand. Okay. Um, it's 1.43. We are 13 minutes out of our time. And I would have to close this session. Um, there's other more questions that have come through. Um, and briefly, I'll just quickly read them so we can uh, get to understand where how much we have been, um, this session has moved us in, in terms of thinking and um, the issues that are rising. Um, there's a question from um, Ikoha Mali Muhindi, and uh, his question was, uh, are there cases outside Kenya brought against counsel for negligence when dealing with pro bono matters? Um, and then Judith uh, Zevedayo, um, Advocate Judith Zebedayo asked, um, I kindly request to have this session for young lawyers on the best ways we can use this opportunity as pro bono lawyers to gain skills and knowledge from other lawyers or advocates. And then uh, another question from um, Ismail, Ismail Lulambo, Advocate Ismail Lulambo asks, how can different law societies educate some indigent persons to accept the results once they lose their cases? Because sometimes it appears they have no arguable case, but once they lose, they complain to the lawyers, though they have provided them quality of service. Um, Advocate Ismail is from the Zanzibar Law Society. Um, another question was is from Linda Advocate Linda Kiguhi, um, and she asks, extending what pro bono services can be offered is a great initiative. Indeed, it has always been assumed that it's only litigation that can be offered. I shall be look, looking forward to seeing the progress by LSK. Thank you for the update, Faith. And um, there's, a, there's a hand from Advocate uh, Lucius Batty. Can I ask that uh, Lucius Batty's uh, uh, microphone is unmuted so we can take uh, her comment and then we can close. Advocate Lucius Batty, can you hear me? 
Okay, I will just take the last comment, which is from Advocate um, Harry Mbiro from uh, Tanganyika Law Society. And his comment or question is, um, can the ELS champion or gui champion guide for pro bono across the member states so that we can have a seamless go to society plan and borrow a leave from each society to the other? Thank you so much, Advocate Harry, that has been um, noted and uh, we will keep updating you on the progress of this. So with those few questions and comments, I would, um, I would love to close this session. Um, the questions that have not been answered have been taken note of and uh, we will share any information that will best guide on uh, those issues or questions. Um, I take this opportunity to thank our panelists for such uh, um, great insights and for sharing really on uh, and, and, and putting this light on um, the pro bono culture around the East African region and for the East Africa Law Society and the different national birds. Um, once again, I thank uh, the advocates for um, international development, FOID and Roll UK for uh, leading and supporting ELS on this session. And uh, lastly, but not least, I thank all the members who have logged on and uh, given us the one and a half hours or so for this session. Thank you for making it a very successful session. And uh, we hope um, to see you at uh, 2.30 for the next uh, session for this, um, for day one of our ELS conference, which will be on access to justice during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you today, tomorrow, and also at our annual general meeting on the 26th. So thank you.